Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy. Back in the studio today, I got my co-host, Matty B, and Jeff Myers back on the show. Calling in to not really a celebration, but we're going to talk about the Steelers. Missed the playoffs, second year in a row. I've heard Chatter talk to some season ticket holders over the weekend. A lot of them, surprisingly, want Tomlin gone. And I don't know how you can say that when it was very clear the issue with the Steelers this this year was quarterback. Ben Roethlisberger went down early. Big news out of Pittsburgh today when we're recording this again ahead of time for New Year's Eve. Ben Roethlisberger said that he is coming back. He said that the anything else against him where people are saying that he's not coming back, that's false, and that he's been working to get back on the field. It did come out later that he hasn't thrown. They had to connect three separate ligaments in his throwing elbow. So we have no idea how long that recovery is going to be, but I don't think that it would take more than a year. I mean, people blow their knees out these days and are back in a couple weeks. It's just going to be, does that affect his throwing motion. I would imagine this procedure is worse than a Tommy John and it takes baseball players usually a full year to recover and get their stuff back. Unfortunately, there's like no minor league you can send him back to and have him build up his arm strength. He has to come right in and that full year would be at the beginning of next season. And I don't think there's another quarterback on the roster that can get the Steelers to the playoffs as we saw this year. They had a chance, win some games, beat the Jets, win some games that you're supposed to win, and then you're in. So, I don't know, looking forward, Matt, what do you think the situation for the Steelers at quarterback, how do you feel about that? Well, based off of how they played Sunday and couldn't beat the Ravens backups, they're in trouble if they don't have a quarterback for the future. And... Even, even if he does come back next year, Ben's on borrow time. So unless you want to go into a complete rebuilding mode, like we had in the early part of uh, the 2000s and trying to, to recoup some of the pieces back, uh, or late 90s, I should say, they, uh, they need to fight, get some stability at quarterback. So originally, I thought, well, Philip Rivers – came in about the same time as, as Walter's Burger. He might fit the bill, but I got one better for you. How'd you feel about Jameis Winston coming up from Tampa Bay to take the, take the range in Pittsburgh? I mean, think about it. They both strong-arm quarterbacks. Jameis led the NFL in passing yards this year. It, they both throw a lot of touchdown passes and a lot of interceptions. So Pittsburgh fans wouldn't really have to miss a whole lot from Walter's What do you think? Well, they also have their own off-the-field issues. Very similar in that regard as well. So another key point that you missed there, I think that was on purpose, Matt. But I don't know. Because I, I honestly, I don't mind it. Because looking at what was there with Rudolph and Duck, Rudolph, I, I know I slammed him last week because I thought he can come back into the game. They put him on the injured reserve. It was his throwing shoulder. And it's going to take a longer time for him to recover. But he should be healthy going into next year. But even before that injury, I wasn't confident with him. Sure, is he going to get back and and try to get to that next level? I mean, if you're looking for a stopgap quarterback, what about uh, Fitzpatrick? Fitzmagic just beat the Patriots, knocked them out of the bye for the playoffs. He did it with the Dolphins. I mean, that's a franchise that can't even buy a win since the Dan Marino days. And then he comes in there and turns it around. Why not give him a shot with the young Steelers defense if you're going to go with a guy that can somehow sometimes make boneheaded moves and throw interceptions? Give him a shot. I mean, at this point, I really don't care because, like Matt said, you're coming from, are you going to go all the way back to the 1999 Steelers, when they were having quarterback issues, they were going through some transitions, and it really didn't start to settle until they were able to get Tommy Maddox from the XFL, fresh off a championship. XFL's back. Are they going to be able to find maybe a hidden gem like that? I don't know. I mean, Jeff, you have season tickets. 
what do you feel going into the off season? I think the major concern this year is the offenses as a whole. Obviously, the quarterback position is very important, and we saw this year that everyone on the roster can't get it done. Uh, when you have the defense like the Steelers did this year, they they played phenomenal, got turnovers, made big plays, but their offense couldn't put up more than seven or fourteen points a game. When your offense can't score points, you can't win in the NFL. So I wouldn't mind Philip Rivers, honestly. I've always been a big Rivers fan. Um, I would like to stick with Roethlisberger if he's able to come back and play at the level he has been playing at. It's just really tough to like know because it's not a knee injury. This is a throwing arm. Um, there's no, there's, there's no idea, like there's no way to determine whether he's going to be co- be able to come back at full tilt. So it's re- it's really going to be tough. Yeah, just think back to when Peyton Manning had his neck injury and then his his wife used all his HGH. And then he came back into the league and he was throwing like a rubber arm. That's what I have a feeling Ben Roethlisberger is going to look like next year. Because I, I just think it's going to be hard to come back from that. And yeah. I don't think it will be a year. I think it's going to take possibly two years for him to get the full strength. And at that point, he's going to be how old? Like, is it going to be worth it? Is he ever going to return to tip top shape? Look what's happening to Tom Brady. I've said it before. Steelers should just get Tom Brady. Let him sit on the bench and rest because early season Tom Brady was awesome. Once he started to get worn down throughout the long season, he's done. So this is my plan. You sign Tom Brady. You let Ben Roethlisberger start the season. He usually lasts a couple games before he gets injured. Very similar to Brady when he gets suspended. Then a fresh off suspension, Tom Brady comes in. He's healthy for the playoffs, win the Super Bowl. It's a foolproof plan. (laughs) <laughs> it, all you need is Belichick to get pissed off at Tom Brady enough to let him go and then you have two quarterbacks Tom Brady old so he can only do like half a season at most and Ben Roethlisberger also old he just needs to not not get injured until Tom Brady's ready to go in or he can just get a quarterback and not have to worry about geriatric league <laughs> but Matt yeah, Peyton Manning got a Super Bowl do you want that Tom Brady Super Bowl to go to someone else it's going to go nowhere. What if he landed with the Browns and their young young team? OBJ, could you imagine him throwing the OBJ? And Landry Jones? It, it wouldn't matter. Because I, I think that part of the reason that he's as successful at his age right now is the fact that he's still playing consistently in the same offense. If you juggle him around and start throwing different coordinators, different coaches, different schemes, different everything, he's not going to be the same type of player. But... McDaniels is rumored to be the Browns' next coach. That's why I use that as an example. McDaniels goes there. Tom Brady ends up there. He he actually has weapons on his team. You know what I mean? It's not like Belichick's defense has been shutting teams down. He lets Fitz Magic throw all over him. Like, I thought that was his head coach's thing. Everyone said, oh, the offense looks so bad. Where's Belichick's defense? That's an anomaly. One game. That cost them home field advantage, or not home field advantage, it cost them the buy for the playoffs. So it counts, Matt. I know you love Belichick. You love Belichick more than I love Tom Brady. <laughs> and that's saying something. Because I was traveling and I planned my travel so that I could see, watch a Steelers game. I don't know why. Because I was just embarrassed, thinking, what a waste of my time. But my mom was still sending me Tom Brady updates. She's texting me the stat lines. So that I can keep up to date with Tom, see what, how he's doing, <laughs> making sure that he's not losing the game, which he did. He did pretty well. So I don't think that loss was on him. People might say, well, he threw that interception. I didn't see. Yeah, he threw a pick six. <laughs> I didn't see it, it Jeff. Hey, when Tom yeah. Brady can't, can't throw the ball more than five yards anymore, throws a pick six, it doesn't matter how good your defense is. If you bring Tom Brady to the Steelers, it's going to be the same thing. And like Matt said, a whole different scheme, new offense, new coaches. Tom Brady will not do well in Pittsburgh. There's no way. He doesn't have the arm strength anymore. And maybe I'll be proven wrong here in the playoffs, but he's not going to do well this postseason. He doesn't have that luxury of having a home game this year. I think since 2009, they've had a bye every time. I'm not sure you would have to look that up, but since 2009, they've always had a bye. In the years they don't have byes, they don't make the Super Bowl. So... I wouldn't want Tom Brady on my team at, what, 42 years old? He'll be 43 next year. 
Well, just think about it, Jeff. You're looking at Tom Brady. Do you really want him to go to the Browns and win a Super Bowl? Because that, that could be an, uh, another scenario. Everyone said, oh, Peyton Manning, he's going to go here, he's going to go there. They let him run his exact same offense because they knew that the Broncos had a nice young team that everyone had been picking, and they got destroyed that one Super Bowl. I think that was Manning before. Then they finally clicked. That's all it takes with Tom Brady. He comes in. That's a young core. A lot of people were picking them for the Super Bowl. What did they need? A quarterback that actually threw to his weapons instead of Baker Mayfield doing God knows what back there. Yeah, but it's two different scenarios. The Broncos at that time were an, you know, were an established franchise, had a an amazing defense, had weapons on offense. The Browns, yeah, they're very talented, but as you saw this year, they couldn't play as a team. They were poorly coached. I think the Browns' biggest issue is getting a stable coach because that organization was a one playoff win in the last, what, 30 years? I don't even know the stat on that, but there's no way Tom Brady – steps into the, uh, the role for the Browns and does anything remotely productive. There's no way. And OBJ is out. There's no way he's staying in Cleveland another year. They have him locked so right up for four years. What's he going to do, hold out? He's, uh, who knows? He does not walk back. Find his way to three different teams this past season. <laughs> anything possible. Yeah. Soon to be four. Watch Antonio Brown. He's going to go to the Saints. Then what? If the NFL clears him. Yeah, he's not going to be cleared. He's not going to get cleared. Always off the uh, field shenanigans and social media uh, outbursts. He's not going to go on a team this year. Look at how long the NFL milked that last uh, Saints Super Bowl win. Years they talked about how that helped the Hurricane Katrina. They still talk about it, Jeff. You don't think (laughs) that they're not going to have a chance to have that again, that same marketing. They can bring back the Hurricane talk if they have Antonio Brown and Michael Thomas. That team would be unstoppable on offense. Plus, yeah, they got scammed the last year. Crap. They got scammed last year with the pass interference. So the NFL owes them one. They owe them one Antonio Brown for the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> that's how. That's how you do the backdoor deals. <laughs> uh, let's get into the playoff picture. We talked about um, Tom Brady and the Patriots. Let's kick off with that. They play Tennessee. Tennessee. I thought they were hot. Then they started to squeak their way into the playoffs, just like the Steelers. And they were in the same scenario. And the Texans jumped out on top with their touchdown. And I thought, oh, man, it's going to be a complete back into the playoffs, either with the Steelers or the Titans. But then they were able to pull it out. They have to travel to New England. Can they get it done? Because I'm not sold on Vrabel. I think the Patriots win. Let's go around the horn. Jeff, we'll start with you. Um, unfortunately, I think the Patriots are going to win the game, but the Titans are going to play him very closely. Derrick Henry's been running really well, and he's the key to that offense. If he runs well in Foxborough, they'll have a shot. But I think the Patriots and uh, Bill Belichick will get it done against the Titans. That's the one thing that he's good at is taking away their one weapon, and I don't think Tannehill's going to beat him. That's why I went yeah. with my pick. Matt, what about you? I'm going to go with the upset and go with the Titans. Vrabel, Vrabel play, knows the New England system, and historically the assistants haven't done well against Bill, but I think this is it's time for the changing of the guard. All right, let's get into the next AFC one. Bills at the Texans. I'm going upset in this one. At least I don't know the lines yet. But Bills Mafia, baby. They're going to get it done on the road. I know Bill O'Brien... He's done a good job there, so I wouldn't be surprised if they won. But just for no reason, I'm just going to go Bills because I think that they deserve it. Matt, let's kick it off with you this time. Bills Mafia. That, just because they've had such terrible luck in the playoffs, maybe this is the year that they finally get it done. Jeff, what about you? I would love to see the Bills Mafia win, but they're not winning this week. Houston's going to lock it down. Um I think the game would be completely different if it was in Buffalo. But Houston playing at home, they'll play well. Deshaun Watson's going to have a big game. I don't see Bills Mafia being able to put enough points up to beat Houston on the road. To be honest, I don't think any of these games matter because 
you're just going to try to fight to see who loses to the Ravens in the next round because they're that good. And we'll get into that, those picks next week whenever we see who actually advances, but it's looking like the AFC is one team. Now, on the other hand, the NFC. Crazy playoffs. Let's start with the team that backed in that we all hate, the Eagles. At least I hate them. <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel about them. I was talking to someone over the weekend. They were like, hey, Steelers didn't make the playoffs, so I think I'm going to root for the Eagles. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Why would you ever do that? <laughs> I don't think any uh, Red Sox fan would be like, yeah, we didn't make it this year. I'm, I'm going to start pulling for the Yankees. Like that would never happen. That's a 0% chance. That's how the Steelers should view Eagles fans. I know they're not in the same division. It's not as, he as heated as the Ravens, but come on. Don't cheer for the Eagles. They backed their way in. I'm not sold on Wentz as a quarterback. I'm going to go with my man Pete Carroll. Seahawks take it on the road because let's be honest the Eagles shouldn't even have home field advantage in this round Matt what do you say I'm gonna lean towards Seattle simply because Marshall Lynch being back for this, the Seahawks <laughs> he's he got that Tom Brady treatment just relaxing the entire regular season come back in time for the playoffs so it, he should be well rested and ready to go it looked like we might have got to see him win the game last night but they had that delay of game penalty or oh. whatever happened down the stretch yeah. so really blew that blew the home field advantage in the playoffs i don't remember what the exact tiebreaker scenario would have been but losing that giving the 49ers the number one seed uh jeff what are your thoughts going into the seahawks matchup um i usually don't like when uh, west coast teams travel the east coast for playoff games but i think seattle's too too much for the eagles um russell wilson is a way better quarterback than uh than when so I'll take Russell Wilson and, and Seattle, but I really wanted Seattle to uh, knock off the 49ers because that would have put them at the three seed, and then the 49ers would have been the fifth seed. So it definitely shaked up, you know, it shook up the playoffs a good bit with uh, with that outcome last night of the 49ers winning because they, like you mentioned, they're the number one seed now and they they're going to play well at home. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. We'll see how these you know these wild card games go, but I'll definitely take Seattle. At Philadelphia. All right, we got our last matchup, the Vikings, another cursed team. Unfortunately, by whatever, you can just call it the grace of the gods, they get thrown against the Saints, where the Saints look like they're on a war path, the fighting Antonio Browns when they pick him up. <laughs> I, I just don't see how the Vikings are going to get past them, and I feel bad for their fans. That's why maybe the Bills winning – would make me feel a little bit better for disenfranchised uh, fans out there of NFL teams that just don't win. Uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts on that game? I'm taking the Saints. They're way too much for the Vikings. Uh, I feel bad as well because I actually like the Vikings. I like their team. But unfortunately, they're not going to go into New Orleans and win a playoff game. Drew Brees, the offense is clicking. There's no shot for the Vikings. The only way the Vikings have a remote possibility is is if they run the ball well. That's the only way. But I, I just don't see it happening. The Saints have been playing tough on defense. They played the 49ers tough this year. I see the Saints uh, walking away with this one. Yeah, it's a shame they just don't have a good running back to control <laughs> the ground game. Matt, what are your yeah. thoughts of that game? Minnesota. The Dalvin Cook. <laughs> Who thought he did against that stout Michigan defense? Just run him wild. We'll just, they'll just tell, they'll tell him it's not... The first round of the playoffs, I'll tell him it's the Orange Bowl, and he'll just go crazy. <laughs> Are you going to have the luxury of the Saints defender sitting out the bowl game? The entire Saints defense wasn't <laughs> sitting the Orange Bowl game, so I think they'll uh, We'll see. If, I, I mean, I think that one, to be honest, if I'm looking at the matchups, I think that might be the tightest game of the weekend. I know the, Saints, the Saints are looking at as – a team that's going to go out there and score like 100 points, but the Vikings play great defense, and that usually sets them up for close games. Wasn't it the same matchup where, was it Stefan Diggs took one to the house? Yep. Yes. It, two years ago. Two years yeah. ago. So, I mean, these guys have some history of meeting in the playoffs. It's going to be a good first round. Luckily, the Cowboys didn't sneak in because I think that would have ruined it a bunch. Uh, instead, they get to join the possible coaching carousel 
We're cheated up um, going into this week. And to me, it's starting to get out of control because Browns fired Kitchens. I mentioned it earlier in the show. And why? You have a six-win team. You have a young quarterback. You had how many wins last last year? Not that many. So you basically grew as a team. Why not give him one more year? See what happened. I mean, you have the Lions, on the other hand, with Matt Patricia. They're just kind of like wandering around in the desert. And that's another quarterback that they have locked up for uh, a while in Stafford. And I know he always gets injured, but like at some point, do they just move him? Are they going to try to keep him playing until he's 40? I have no idea. But the Browns, look at what other teams have done. Steelers have had like four coaches going back like 40 years. Browns seem like they have a new coach every year. Why are you making that move? And I hate the Browns. So, like, I don't want to see them be successful, but they're really going in on McDaniels, it seems like, from New England. And how many of those New England coaches have worked out? Zero? How many? No, I mean, no. you can count Bill O'Brien possibly, but he took a stay at Penn State first to get some head coaching experience. You, I mean, you just don't hire guys that don't have the experience from New England because they haven't been able to recreate it. If there was a track record of like coaches leaving Bill Belichick and having been groomed into like elite head coaches, then yeah, I would say, okay, take a gamble. But I mean, you already grew as a team. What more do you want from your coach? Were you expecting a young team to just make the playoffs first year? Did you believe all the Vegas stuff? Because that one's crazy to me. Uh, Matt, what's your craziest coaching change so far? Well, it's it's the riverboat Ron Rivera going to Washington. I mean, to me, Washington and Cleveland are the two jobs that I think you don't touch with a 10 foot pole because the owners are psychotic. And, and I, I, I kind of see in Cleveland situation where they, they had kind of something going, but with the pieces that they have, the expectations are to win right now. And they just, they weren't doing it on any kind of consistent level. And when you have like speculations of OBJ just being like, get me out of here to Lamar Jackson, like you can't have that. Like there's there's definitely chemistry or culture issues in that locker room, and I think why would you go there? Same with Washington. They cut they fired Gruden right in the middle of the season. That that is a major red flag because now you're stuck with this interim. You you can't wait till after the regular season's done to to get rid of your guy. So the the coach that that I kind of was leaning towards was Rivera. And, and I thought he would have been um, a better fit somewhere else, but it looks like they're, they're really high on him in Washington, and that's probably where he's going to end up. I actually don't see that as a bad fit because Rivera is one of the guys that I know I ripped on in the past, but he's got his wins, and he's gotten to the point where I feel like Redskins fans would be, would be happy. They'd be happy with that output, like seven, eight wins a year, Whatever he's been doing, yeah, he has some high years where things finally click and you can make a run to the Super Bowl. I feel like Redskin fans would be really pumped if that were to happen. Well, the one thing I don't know did the Panthers did they make a decision on who they're hiring? Because they interviewed Mike McCarthy. Well, they looked at McCarthy, and I don't think I don't think McCarthy would be a bad fit there. But they were also looking at Eric Bieniemy, the I believe he's OC for the Chiefs. Yeah, but why would you go from Ron Rivera to Mike McCarthy? We already did the comparison of Ron Rivera to Jason Garrett. Mike McCarthy is the exact same. You're just recycling coaches at that point. The only thing is he has one Super Bowl over a decade ago. But he has a Super Bowl. Like, is that, is that what your difference is? Like, is that the only difference? Rivera got them there. How many times has McCarthy got them back? Well, be honest. I mean, who are you going to bring in right now? That's going to do something revolutionary. You're, you're all you're doing is you're changing tires, and you at the NFL. It's it's we, you complain about it all the time recycling coaches. It's absolutely what's going to happen. You're not going to bring someone in with fresh ideas when you can take 
similar schemes, and there you go, serve it out there. I mean, you look how fast uh, Peterson's staff got gutted after he won the Super Bowl with Philadelphia. All those offensive coaches got poached. So, I mean, it, it's just a matter of time till they, they filter around. I think if you want to get a jump on something, why not take a pass at Lincoln Riley? I mean, it's pretty clear that Oklahoma is not going to be able to compete with the big boys. I mean, let's be honest. Not with recruiting, not with the defense, but he has the offensive scheme in the NFL. You don't have that talent difference. Why not take a run, see if his offense can work? I mean, if someone was willing to give Cliff Kingsbury the keys to the kingdom, why not? How about a coach that's actually, you know, winning? So, I mean, that's what I would do. If I was a head coach, you're looking at the young teams. Like, if you're the Browns, why not just offer him everything? I mean, Bob Stoops groomed him. He's ready right there. You can bring some stuff in and let him bring some guys in, kind of like they did with Cliff Kingsbury. You have some of the younger guys. You can reunite them with Baker Mayfield. Maybe some of those locker room issues get resolved and see where it goes from there. If, you, if you're going to go crazy, I mean, there, there's there been heavy rumors that Urban Meyer has been looking at the NFL. I think he has his eyes on the Dallas Cowboys, and I'd be interested to see what he can do there. Is he going to jump, aim for that national championship and Super Bowl champion uh, moniker that's only shared by a couple head coaches? Who is it? Barry Switzer, Jimmy Johnson, and Pete Carroll? Are those? The, I think there's three of them. I could be wrong. I'm, apologies if I missed anyone. But that's rare company. Winning national championships at multiple schools, then you jump to the NFL and win a Super Bowl, he'd be the greatest coach of all time. I mean, hand, bar none, you're the greatest coach of all time because no one else has done that. Only Nick Saban has won national championships at multiple schools. He sucked in the NFL. If Urban Meyer were to make that jump and win a Super Bowl, I mean, that's where Jimmy Johnson got it done. Is that where Switzer got it done, too? Switzer just took over after Jimmy Johnson left. Yeah, didn't Mm. he win with the Cowboys? (laughs) Yeah, he did a Tom one. Yeah, that's exactly (laughs) how. (laughs) Doesn't matter. He just did the, he's like, oh, so we're just going to do the exact same thing. All right. (laughs) Doesn't matter. That's where. Uh, college coaches that want to win the Super Bowl go. Maybe Urban Meyer knows that. Uh, Jeff, what are your what's your craziest coaching change so far? I think the whole Dallas debacle is Jerry Jones finally the the marriage with uh Jason Garrett's over. I thought for the last couple of months it was going to be Lincoln Riley, but I guess like you mentioned, there's been rumors of Urban Meyer there. But I think Link- Lincoln Riley would be a good fit for the Cowboys. Um. It's just amazing in the last, what, 15 years, the, the talent year in and year out the Cowboys have on that team, and they end up 8-8. Eight and eight. It's amazing. 8-8 eight and eight every year. They somehow just magically, right there, almost make the playoffs. They make the playoffs. They can't win. I mean, their best chance of winning was the year with Tony Romo um, in the, what was it, the Des Bryant when he didn't catch the ball but really caught it, like that game against the Packers. Ever since then, they haven't been a legit threat. So I think it's time for Jerry Jones and Dallas Cowboys to move on from Garrett. Maybe Urban Meyer, maybe Lincoln Riley. Um, I also saw something where uh, McCartney's going to interview with the Browns. That would be uh, really interesting. Uh, I think a m- nice little marriage there. I think he could maybe give them a spark. But well, you don't like McCartney to the uh, Browns? Dude, he was a, uh, he was a bomb. Why would he do anything with the green or why would he do anything with the Browns? I like River. I, I would have liked Riverboat Ron in Dallas. He already had his running quarterback in Cam. He can just keep pick it, keep it going with Dak Prescott and Zeke. I just don't think that the Cowboys were that talented. I mean, I think the NFL, the talent gap is so close that you can take a team like New England that has a bunch of nobodies on offense and win a Super Bowl. I think it comes down to a lot of coaching and a lot at the quarterback position. And I don't think Tom or Tony Romo was able to make that jump into elite quarterback company. But Joe Flacco. Uh, yeah. I would say Tony Romo is a pretty, pretty good quarterback. 
especially if you're going to compare him to Flacco. If you look at if you look at Romo's career and his stats, he never won the big game. He choked every year, but year in and year out, he was a great regular season quarterback. <laughs> yeah, at some point you have to make that jump from good quarterback to great elite quarterback. I mean, a lot of that one playoff loss was his. He fumbled the snap. That was also what his his first year as starting quarterback. He came in like halfway through the season, and it set the tone, Jeff, for his entire career. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Cowboys that, fans <laughs> should have known. Like, look what we're getting ourselves into. Because yeah. I mean, honestly, you can't be excited. Like, if if they would say, "Hey, Tony Romo's coming back to coach the Steelers," I'd say, "Up, oh, what's going to be different than the exact same thing that happened this year?" Nothing. You could say the same for Philip Rivers. Is he if he went to the Steelers? Is it going to be any different? I mean, he had Ladanian Tomlinson and well, Antonio Gates on the same team at one point, and like you have all these offensive weapons. How are you not able to at least get your team to the next level or at least the AFC Championship game? Hell, Mark Sanchez wasn't he in an AFC Championship game? Yeah, that was yeah. The- lost to the Steelers. So I mean, come on. It, it, it's crazy to me. I don't know, though. With Phillip Rivers, who was his best receiver he had in his career? Obviously, Antonio Gates is a Hall of Famer. Was Michael Floyd his best receiver over his tenure? No, Keenan Allen. Okay. Yeah, Granted, he gets hurt. Allen. When he's yeah. in. But whatever. I mean, like, comparing, like, injuries, I, I would take Keenan Allen over Juju. If you're talking about number one wide receivers. What's the difference? Yeah. He just played a little bit more. Who, Juju? Yeah. They should just get rid of him. Matt, are you <laughs> are you confident about Juju? I've been on my anti-Juju thing all year. What? He's not a number one. Let some he's team not- that thinks he's a number one give up some stuff and get a true number one or just keep what going you, with possession get- receivers. Bear. What, Matt? The cover's pretty bare. What what would you what would you think would be acceptable? either trade or what What would you want to get out of moving him? Any receiver that doesn't lose three games. I mean, two fumbles and then that, that weird jump that he tried against, was it the Jets? Like, come on. Any normal receiver, Matt. Any normal receiver, that's all I want. Then you don't have the headaches of him doing TV commercials and all this other <laughs> stuff. I mean, I, you might be a little harsh on Juju if you consider his career so far. He had two really, really good years. Ben Roethlisberger is down this year. He has Duck and Mason Rudolph throwing to him. He gets hurt. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really bad season, but I wouldn't write him off yet. I'm very interested to see how he performs next year, especially if Ben comes back, and maybe they add some addition, you know, additional pieces to that offense. The one thing we, we haven't talked about is how old the Steelers' offensive line is getting. This year, the Steelers' offensive line has played – well, I, I would consider it pretty poorly when you consider the last like five to ten years. Pouncey's getting old. He's not the center he used to be. DeCastro is starting to show signs of uh, aging. Bill Nuevo could not play t- left tackle this year in the NFL. For some reason, he ended up getting a holding call almost every possession. He played really bad the left tackle position. So when you consider all those factors... Yeah, Juju didn't play well this year, but did he, did he have a lot to go with? I mean, I'm looking at the stats right now. Uh, he was third in receiving. Behind, well, fourth if you count Jalen Samuels. But just in the receivers, Deontay Johnson was ahead of him, and so was James Washington. I mean, uh, number one, what other team has had a number one receiver finish like third? But is that number one receiver missed five games? But he's number one in partying. Yeah. <laughs> a number one in dancing for sure. I mean, yeah, he played 12 games. Let's see what he, I mean, his yards per catch were behind James Washington. So even if you're looking at that, I don't think he would have jumped him. I mean, James Washington had 700 something yards. So, yeah. You're just looking at it from a perspective. I like Johnson and I like Washington, both young guys. If you can get stuff for Juju, get stuff for him. If it's another quarterback or whatever you're going to do, I mean, I think you should be open to it. That's all I'm saying. 
No, just sign Jameis Winston. Then you have the quarterback, and then you have the extra <laughs> cap space that you can get a, an aging wide receiver. And definitely maybe, keeps maybe you. Maybe Larry Harold will come home. Yeah, what if you did that, Jeff? If they got rid of Juju, got some other key pieces, and they brought in Larry Fitzgerald, what would you say? I'd be all right with that. <laughs> you would, would love it. You would uh, buy yeah. a Fitzgerald jersey yeah. the first day. Oh, 100%. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't want them bringing in uh, Jameis. I, I don't know the stat on this, but he made the 30-30 club this year, which I don't know how many quarterbacks have ever done that. 33 touchdowns, 30 picks. That That hasn't been done many times in the NFL, right? I don't Especially know. Especially with the yards. Like, there's no way that's been done. For a starting quarterback, 30 picks in the NFL. 5,000 yards. <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder how many total points he scored when you consider the, the amount of pick six he threw. But if you look at his receivers, who does he have on that team? Mike he Evans. Rick hands Mike Evans. Yeah, Mike <laughs> Mike drops Evans. <laughs> that's your guy? That's Is that it? He didn't have much on offense, but he had Godwin. <laughs> well, I guess he did have Godwin, but I mean, at some point, some of it's on the play calling too. Although yeah. you know the Steelers are going to have him just throwing up in deep coverage, so the interceptions would continue. Well, yeah. exactly. He he's coming from Bruce Arians, who built the offense that we have our Chuck and Duck now based off of. <laughs> so it just it fits perfect. He's a perfect fit to drop back. He's big bodied like Roethlisberger, so he can just stand back there and run around like a loon and just chuck it up. It'll be like uh, we ha- we have we have two quarterbacks that do the exact same thing: one's young, one's old. <laughs> I'm not against it. I know you thought that I was going to going to be. You wouldn't tell me before the show, but <laughs> I-, I don't care at this point. Give me someone that's going to excite me because I'm tired of having a quarterback. Th- that's the question. Who? If he can grow a beard, then it's a lock. Who, Jameis Winston? Yeah. I don't know. Did he grow one? No, but he should. <laughs> I don't know. Ben said he's not He's not going to cut his until he can throw again. Who knows how long that will be? <laughs> <laughs> what they if he can't? <laughs> but, I mean, anything else you guys got for the NFL? Negative. We'll see what happens. I, it's going to be a crazy offseason. It already has started with that new coaching changes. So we'll check back in next week and see what happens. Um, Matt, do you have anything for high tempo this week? This week, actually, there was just one little thing that I wanted that came across. Uh, Marvin Wilson, Florida State defensive tackle, and Tamari and Terry are both deciding to come back next year. And those are huge pickups for Florida State because Marvin Wilson led Florida State with five sacks. Um, and that was with him missing the last three games because of injury. And Tamari Terrian was, uh, he averaged 20 plus yards of reception. So getting both of them back provides a lot of depth and a lot of leadership for the team that desperately needs it right now. So definitely a big, big bump to the recruiting that Norvell and his staff is, is putting together and glad that they're coming back for another year. Jeff, you got anything for high tempo? Uh, my high tempo talk uh, topic has to do with the Steelers struggling this year. So this is the second consecutive year the Steelers haven't made the playoffs. So they're now eligible for hard knocks. So looking at the teams that possibly could be the hard knocks team of the year, looks like Lions, Cardinals, Broncos, Steelers, uh, Jags, and Giants um, are ineligible because they fired their head coaches. So looking, I don't know if there's any more teams, but those are the ones I immediately saw. Looks like the Steelers might be the hard knocks team this year, and that would be a huge distraction coming off an eight and eight season. So what better time to get Jameis Winston in? <laughs> Let him handle our- all the off the field stuff while Ben Roethlisberger just gets healthy. Do we want him still in crab legs on national or on HBO? <laughs> Where are you buying crab legs in Pittsburgh? You dumbass. Hey, <laughs> wow. hey then get on, took get it to 100 district. Hey, <laughs> you can go down the strip district, go down the holies or one of those places. <laughs> he would have to steal them. Yeah, Matt, you could you could haul you could just get your own crab legs. I'll I'll give them to you. I'll meet you halfway. I'll drive up with some fresh crab legs. You take them up and just give them to him out of a van. <laughs> out of a van. <laughs> I don't know how many he'll need. I I assume he's going to give some to the team. So we'd need a, a bu- like a, a whole truckload, van load, whatever we want to call it. So if he comes to Pittsburgh, we'll reach out and see if he wants us to do that. 
<laughs> that way we with no legal issues we'll we'll do our part um i had one other one fried tempo rush probes from was he the coach from georgia that got fired he has started yes. his we'll own go ahead matt give us some background for people that because i i don't remember all the details he was he was the head coach at Colcourt county down in georgia and it's one of the biggest high schools in the state um they were a multi-state championship school he was making over six figures as a high school head coach which is pr- pretty amazing and he, i think he, at the time he was the highest paid coach in, in georgia high school but because of some some different things off the field uh he was he ended up getting fired and we we discussed it earlier in the year on this show so go ahead and pick up he has been hired as a head coach of a new school in Alabama that is going to rival what IMG does in Florida, where they're a technology-based high school. And because they're technology-based and distance learning is their their selling point, they're going to be able to pull recruits from all over the area, possibly all over the United States, to come down and basically just become a football factory. So he lands on his feet. No big deal there. Uh, starting another school. There are a whole bunch of these. Uh, we always talk about the St. Francis Academy because of Biff Pogey and his connection to Michigan. That's one where people were just refusing to play his team. That's the kind of level that uh, probes are probably going to be able to build down in Alabama, which, to be honest, is only going to make recruiting easier for out-of-state schools. So I don't see how teams like Alabama and Auburn are going to be too happy about this. Because I think when IMG happened and they started to really take off, I think that kind of does the advertising for a lot of the smaller schools or just out-of-state schools that aren't able to get to all the high school games in that state to see recruits in action. Now the state is doing all of that legwork for them. And you're saying, here, you want to come down from the north? Michigan and Ohio State and Penn State, all our best guys are right here at IMG. You only have to come scout one school. Then you can start to build a pipeline with that. And I I just don't see how those other schools are going to be happy. And to be honest, if it keeps going in this direction, I'll love it for that reason. The crazy thing with that school being built, I did see one thing on it. They're they're building an indoor practice facility that – is a copy of the Tennessee Titans. So you have you have this like this private high school that's that's getting donations for an indoor practice facility, and Miami can't even get a full size indoor facility correct. <laughs> that's what I was going to say next. Who do you think will have theirs built first, Miami <laughs> or this new school? Oh, the new school because they're just building it the way it was supposed to be built in the first place. Hell, we could even throw another one in. Greg Schiano at Rutgers. That was one of his selling points, and that was one of the sticking points is he wanted a football facility. Which one of those three schools is going to have their stuff in place first? Depends on who starts winning first. (laughs) Those big donors. Like I said, I don't know how donors in Alabama, just because of how tight-knit they were. Remember, that was a state that really kicked out the Jim Harbaugh tour of -of out-of-state football camps. Remember when that was legal? And he, he pulled Nico Collins, big time receiver that is rumored to possibly stay in college. But he, he was able to flip that recruit from Alabama to Michigan based on those camps. And immediately Alabama went to the NCA and were like, Hey, you need to stop this. Now you're just taking all those recruits that other schools might not be able to get to and you're putting them in one spot. Nice for the picking. So now your Notre Dames, your your USC's, whoever else wants to come in, Texas wants to come in Alabama, they can just scoot all down to this new school. Nice and convenient. And then you know Pitt will be there. <laughs> so like, hey, you didn't get much playing time here, but you can come to us. I'm sure we'll take you. <laughs> Cause they recruit Florida. That's like that's their number one recruiting ground. Whippeo, nah. No need. No need for the Whippeo kids when you can go to Florida, Matt. The pit way. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's get into the college football playoffs. The first thing I have to ask you guys, uh, did you think, we'll start with you, Jeff. Did you think it was a catch and a fumble in the Ohio State-Clemson game? 
I'm so torn on this, honestly. <laughs> I, I would probably have to say my, my initial thought process was a catch, then a fumble. That I don't know. I It just depends. I don't know. That's what I'm going to stick with. I'm going to say it was a catch, then a fumble. Matt, what about you? Yeah, I think it was. I think with the with the way that he had the ball secured, even though it wasn't against his body, he checked all the boxes for it to be identified as catch, the athletic move, the something after. I I think they got it wrong. I got to go opposite. I don't think it checked all the boxes. He didn't make a football move because he never tucked the ball. He tried to, but that's whenever the ball was knocked out of his hand. And I can go right to the NFL because the NFL, they had all their officials going on ESPN, going on all these talk shows and saying about how in the NFL it would have been a catch. Bullshit. Because Jesse James had a catch against the Patriots a couple years ago for the Steelers where he caught the ball away from his body. He turned into the end zone. That's the exact same play. That is the exact same thing that all these NFL guys are saying. He he made a football move. He turned the ball in his hand, even though he never technically touched it. Should have been a catch. Bullshit. Why wasn't it in the NFL then? You said he has to go to the ground with it or all this other stuff. He didn't. He never tucked it. He never made a football move. He never turned up field. Unfortunately, the Ohio State guy was in a hell of a position. And because of that, he knocked the ball out. But let's, let's put it this way. If that was in the end zone and he was crossing across the middle of the field, he took two or three steps. Do you think they would have gave him a touchdown? No. They wouldn't have. They would have said he did not complete the process of the catch. So why is it different on like the 20-yard line? And that's my thing. You can't tell me Jesse James catching the ball away from his body, turning to stretch it out across the goal line, which is a football move, is different than the guy from Clemson. He never actually got to tuck the ball because the Ohio State guy's hands were in there. They said that you could see the ball moving. Of course it was moving. He never tucked it. He was trying to position it. The guy, the defender had his hand in there. He made a great play. Unfortunately, uh, he ended up hurting his team because they thought they had a touchdown. And I understand people said, well, the call on the field, they didn't blow the play dead because they didn't want to over like ruin a possible touchdown. And they're taught to do that. If it's a questionable fumble with an immediate recovery, they're taught not to blow the whistle because they want to be able to go to replay and see if they got it right. And unfortunately, I don't know. I could see it both ways, to be honest. But you can't tell me that he he tucked the ball. He didn't. The guy's hand was in the way. He didn't make a football move. He was going backwards the entire time. Because, Matt, I got one more for you before you go. If, If he made a football move and that was a catch... Why wasn't it forward progress then? Because that would have came before the fumble. He was pushed back two or three yards. He wasn't. He didn't turn up field. He was getting pushed backwards, blow the whistle, forward progress. It never would have been a fumble. I don't see but any way that it could have been a fumble. Go ahead. In that situation, the referees are told, let, let it play out. Just let the play roll. And if, if there's an issue... They'll correct it on the replay. Is, is the route that they go with it. this way? If if they blow it down, there there's there's nothing that they can't go back and overturn. Them. But if they let it go on the field, then they have the chance to review it. They reviewed it, and obviously they went with the route that they they decided to go with. So the, the higher ups, whoever was reviewing it, thought that that it needed to go in a different direction. So that that's with the ability of having all these multiple angles and, and different review stuff that that's what they came up with. So, you know, you can't fault the system of letting it go. And I mean, there's been games Michigan got screwed against army this year because they blew the whistle on a clear fumble. And one of the defenders picked it up for Michigan, took it to the house. They had already blown the whistle and that play sent the game basically into overtime. If Michigan were able to, have the correct ruling of scoop and score that game never would have went to overtime this year. So I understand for the big time game, they're going to swallow their whistle. I just think that they picked the lesser evil. Could you have imagined if they would have came out and said it was a catch, but forward progress was stopped. Dude, the place would have been a hundred times more nuts, but that's a good point. 
He was going backwards. He never turned up field. So I, I just don't see how in any scenario that could have been a fumble. Because like you, you're, you're driven back five yards. They said he took four steps, what, backwards? How many times does a quarterback get caught and they drag him four yards backwards and knock the ball out and they call it a fumble? They always call forward progress. If you're going backwards four yards, I mean, that's that's basically what it is. Jeff, you have anything to say on that? No, I mean, just that what you said, like nine times out of ten, they call forward progress in those situations. So it's very, very rare um, for them not to do that. But it's pretty much all I have for that. Like, based on what happened, probably should have been forward progress. And I'm just going to stick with this game because the LSU game was just a beatdown. I mean, <laughs> do we really even need to talk about that game? Because Oklahoma, it's clear they didn't belong. And this is why, and I'll make my point before I get back into my other topics for the Clemson-Ohio State game. But you have four teams in the playoffs. You can't tell me that an expanded playoff wouldn't be better. And I, I pitched this to you, Jeff, during the game. You, you're telling me, oh, LSU would have blown out whoever they faced. Okay, they blew out Oklahoma. Why not have them blow out FAU or Memphis or some other group of five team? Just make everyone, put everybody in the playoffs. What's the difference if I have to watch Oklahoma get their ass kicked uh, compared to FAU? The difference is there's only two playoff games. Almost every year, the playoff games have been a bust because they're not picking the right teams. You're limiting it to four. Oregon Oregon was probably a better team than Oklahoma. They played Auburn tougher. Oklahoma played UCLA. That was their only other Power 5 game because the Big 12 is stuck in a nine-game schedule just like the Big 10 and Pac-12 for some reason. The most idiotic decision of all time. And now you're getting, you don't know how good uh, Oklahoma is. They're getting put in the playoffs. Yeah, they took Georgia to the wire, but then that Georgia team uh, kind of fell apart. Oklahoma hasn't been recruiting the same since Bob Stoop left. It's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse for them. Lincoln Riley, there's no way he's going to keep recruiting at the level that he is if he keeps getting his ass kicked in bowl games. So uh, just expand it. I don't go to eight because I think you're going to get into the same situation where you're going to have a couple auto bids from the power five get in and they really don't deserve it. And then you're going to have a couple at large bids always crushing them. And then you're only going to make the rich get richer. Just go to 16, let all 10 teams get an automatic qualifier. Then you have six teams at large case closed. Nobody gets a buy because the group of five teams will act like a buy. If LSU is gonna gonna kill someone, let them kill a, a conference champion from a lower division. Let them kill Boise like Washington did, and then maybe once a blue moon, you'll get an upset because the 16 upset Virginia in the college basketball tournament two years ago, a Virginia team that the next year won the national championship. So let those smaller schools in, and then you might not have as many coaches leaving. Maybe Mike Norville stays at Memphis instead of going to Florida State because he has a playoff game to get ready for. I mean, at least incentivize some of these smaller schools because at this point, why are they playing the bull games? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But we'll get into the bulls here in a second. My other question is, uh, we'll, we'll start with you again, Jeff. Why do you think they can't get the field situation right in these playoff games? Play players were slipping all over the field. And it's almost yeah. embarrassing. To the point yeah, where see, every game I watch, it's like a player's going to get hurt out there, and it's not fun. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on, especially when you have these you know top athletes who aren't able to cut and uh, make the moves that they are you know capable of making. Um, I don't know if they're like returfing the fill with the like, the rubber stuff, and it's causing it to be too slick before all these major games. But there's a problem, and it has to it has to be fixed sooner rather than later because, like you mentioned, someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to tear an ACL in one of these bowl games and they're going to end up ruining their NFL career, you know, get seriously injured. And it's unacceptable when year in, year out, we're watching this over and over. Matt, what are your thoughts as a coach? How do you prepare for a situation like that? 
you just try to simulate it as best as you can and knowing where you're going to be playing and what the field conditions are potentially going to be like. Um, you try to get yourself out in that environment. And I know it's a lot different at the college level because their, their equipment staff is going to be more accommodating than a high school. But I, I tell our kids, like if we're, we're looking at the weather reports and if it looks like it's going to be rain, <laughs> aside from the fact that you're adjusting your game plans to, to accommodate for the weather, you're also looking at what, what plays and what, things do we want our kids to do obviously if, if it's going to be really bad out we don't want them running a lot of moves where they're cutting and making all these different stuff we want to try to put them in spots where they can just get the ball and get north and south and not be sliding all over the place so some of it can be done through scheme but i think with the extra time uh some of these coaches are definitely trying to put more scheme into it that's causing players to try to make more moves because for a lot of these guys these bowl games are a chance to make your make your name, make your money. So if you have a really good performance, there's a chance that your stock can start to rise on some p- potential draft boards. That this is your opportunity to showcase what you got, because you're having so many different players that are just opting out. That if you do, if you perform really well in your bowl game, it can lead to senior invites or some of those other like all star game type performances that set the table for you to have a good combine. Yeah, how much of it do you think falls on the equipment guy? I think part of it does. Um, I'm not going to blame it all exclusively on them because you look at the different length of spikes and different stuff like that. I think that does factor in, and it's something that should be taken into account. But at the end of the day, I'm sure that the players have a certain amount of freedom in terms of what they're wearing as well. But if they're feeling comfortable with a certain type or size of spike, that they're they're going to wear with what they're going to wear what they're comfortable with, even if it means that they're starting to slide. That's a good point because I was always wondering, with all these multi million dollar contracts, why didn't they just have different spike lengths ready to go on the sideline? You have all this other stupid stuff the players have at their disposal, like uh, portable toilets and things like that. Just have spikes ready to go if your guys are falling. Do something to pick it up. Because, I mean, like, some of the ones, like, everyone made a big deal when Michigan played in, like, the Battle of Atlantis or whatever, the basketball tournament. The court was so slippy, Juwan Howard went out and actually started to mop up the court, and everyone was laughing at him. But it's like, at some point, you got to protect your players. And the same thing for that, I, I don't know if it's the same court, but, like, they do that basketball game on, like, the ship. It's like, why? You know the humidity is going to be crazy and the players are going to be falling. Who is this for? It's not for people on the ship. If you wanted more people to watch the game, you would just have them play at an outdoor football field like the hockey does. But whatever. At at some point, you're just looking at another reason to pay the players. Pay them. They can get hurt at any time. Um, Did you think it was targeting, Matt? The hit on Lawrence that kind of turned the game? Oh, my God, yeah. It was helmet to helmet. He lowered his head, and, and it, it was a hundred percent a changing point in that game. I, I thought that was that was the play that let Clemson back into it, because at that point, you know, I I, I was watching it, and my initial reaction to it was uh, that they were looking. He was looking for a kill shot. He had the wide open blitz. He had the free shot, and I think. And I do think he did concuss Lawrence, but somehow um, he cleared the <laughs> protocol because he drilled him. Right yeah. He just shook it off. Yeah. <laughs> he waved him he off. Just, was it Michigan State? And he right off and just went down and spun a touchdown. It's exactly what we talked about with Brian Lewerke at Michigan State earlier in the year. If you just don't go to percuss- concussion protocol, you don't have to worry about it. I guarantee you didn't go over and get checked out. Well, so Higgins, well, Higgins must have did that, too. I'm going to go in the locker room and just take a little nap. And I'm ready for a second. <laughs> I mean, that was the turning point of the game, and we've been talking about it all the time. Don't lower your head as a defender. It is the easiest thing. They're going to review it. If your head is down, you're done. You know your head is down. If you're, if you're going to hit a guy and you see grass, you might as well just get ready to be ejected. There's zero reason for it in today's game. They've been doing this for how many years in a row now? But I'm going to say this too: if you if they if they treat the targeting penalties like 
like the uh, is it the misconduct penalties or the personal foul penalties where you get two of them and you can be ejected if they treated targeting the same way. I think that that it would have been a non-factor with the rest of the game. You get a warning for the first one, ejection on the second targeting. And, and to me, that, that solves the targeting issue that if you have one play where Lawrence did lower his body as well to absorb the, the hit, but to me, he saw the hit was coming and he chose to lower his head. It shouldn't have been targeting. Even though, like, by the rule, it was helmet to helmet, head first, launching into a player. I mean, it it met the criteria for ejection, but I think he saw that that hit was coming and lowered himself to brace him. And it would have looked worse for him to go really low and hit him in the knee or something like that. So within the speed of the game, he did the right thing, but it just came back to bite him. Yeah. But if he's crushing uh, him with his shoulder and hitting, ta- hit him in the head, he could have concussed him worse enough to knock him out of the game with a proper tackle. It, so all he did was cost himself whatever. They, he cost Ohio State basically the game. They were up 16 nothing at that point, I believe. And you made a stupid play. And like you said about doing the warning, that's not going to change it. They get ejected now, they don't even care. Players just yeah. don't care. And you can't tell me it's all in the coaching because they've been doing this for like five or six years, Matt. So, and the thing is, that good, if, you give, if you give them a warning... Why, like, if you're a player and you're a defensive player, you know you have that one warning. You're gonna, you're gonna be head hunting. Why not? Yeah, you're gonna take some shots. It's, yeah, you're not gonna get kicked out of the game. You know you got one in your pocket. It's a big play in a big game. Just go high, lunge at them. It's, you know, what I mean, what's stopping you from doing that? I mean, it's a slippery slope. Like, I hate the rule and I hate that it's one, you know, one targeting you're out of the game. But I don't see how you give them any freebies, though. I really don't. After the Ryan Shazier thing, you can't give them any. Yeah. I mean, because what if the, what if he was paralyzed? That that's yeah. the other side of this. I mean, you can say it's extreme, but it's happened. Like, there's no other way you can say, "Oh, give him one free possible paralyzing hit a game." <laughs> like, I mean, even though they're going to review it, it's still going to get to the point where you're crazily hoping players don't get injured, but you're trying not to eliminate big hits from the game. But like I said, hit him with the shoulder. That's still a hell of a hit. You possibly knock him out of the game. I know that's not what you're trying to do, but hey, you could also put your head on the ball and possibly cause a fumble. No one seems to do that anymore. They just seem to like but, go for the helmet to helmet hit for some reason. But for every Shazir type hit, for every hit that you would say is a head hunting type play, there's probably 10 other plays where there's accidental or incidental helmet to helmet. Yeah that they're trying to make a tackle and guys are getting ejected for no reason. So yeah, you are right that there, there are certain people that those rules aren't going to apply. And if those people are true, then they're going to get both of them and they're going to be out of the game. You, they'll be ejected and, and then it, it solves it on its own. But, but for like, you look at the way that that game played out. If he doesn't get tossed, Ohio state was cruising. And, and the coaching point to that is, it's tough to – you can have a plan in case someone gets thrown out, but that changes your scheme when one of your better players is ejected early in the game, yet to boot. And the thing that, that is bothersome is now, not just for this year, but if he's coming back next year, now he's sitting out the first half of the first game next year. I don't think that matters. Well, it might. From a coaching side of things. <laughs> One half against Akron or whatever uh, podunk school they're playing. <laughs> what if they play a real school, though? That could be the difference in a win and a loss in a you know, possible playoff game. I don't know who they're playing first game next year, but if they play an, you know, an actual opponent, could make the difference. Well, this could be a difference between making fun of them and not making fun of them, so we should look that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but. I, well, there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about. It was... The Clemson score at the end of the game. Do you think they score too fast? Jeff, we'll start with you this time. I debate this back and forth throughout the years. I think you have to, you just have to score. I mean, the whole point is to, you know, have more points in their team. Yeah. They gave Ohio state an opportunity to come back and win the game, but you got to take points when you get points. Uh, that's the bottom line. You got to put points on the board 
And if you have the ability to score, you score. And for the record, I was close. They play Bowling Green first. Okay. <laughs> so very, very close with the Akron. Um, yeah. <laughs> but Matt, what do you think? I, I said, I text you right away. They score too fast. Ohio State's going to win. I didn't know that they were just going to blow it and throw an interception right to the straight to the guy, but <laughs> go ahead. I, I have a hard – it's it's easy to sit in the stands and say you need to milk the clock and you need – but the one thing about offensive football is that points aren't guaranteed. And when you have an opportunity to score, you you have to take advantage of it because you may say in the back of your mind, don't go down, drag this play out, but – when when you get the momentum, you got to ride that momentum and just and get the points when you can because otherwise, if you squander an opportunity, if you let a little bit of life happen to the defense, you're you're turning the ball over. A million things can happen the opposite direction. Take the points while you can, and then put yourself in a spot where your defense can hold. You. The good thing with them scoring that early is, unfortunately, they weren't able to get into a point where it would have been a tie game. They still would have been down by one. But they scored early enough where there was about a minute 50 left that if, even if Ohio State scored, they would have still had a chance to go and kick the field goal to win it. And with their big play offense, it could have happened. Um, the one thing that also stuck out to me was Urban Meyer kept referring to Ohio State as we. And Clemson, they beat Ohio State with the, an old Urban Meyer, Tim Tebow play, the jump pass. So very funny there. Uh, Urban Meyer took some shots at Ryan Day before the game. Strangely, on the Big Ten tailgate, I never watched the show, but I was visiting and they had it on. And it's the the comment he said, "Ryan Day gets more credit than he deserves." And I thought, "Oh, that's kind of weird, Urban, <laughs> that you would just <laughs> flat out say that on TV in the pregame of a playoff game." But then he, uh, the way he was acting on the sideline of the game and calling them "we," I think he feels that he recruited all of that talent. And that was really his team. Well, I like I liked the comment that the person from ESPN made that was like, he said he wanted to spend more time at home with his family, but there he is on the field. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes me think, because we speculated all the way back last year that he was secretly pushed out. And I still think that's the case. And whatever he signed, is it maybe, um, I mean, he's like the assistant AD of Ohio State, probably to stay quiet. I mean, come on, he erased his entire phone. So he had some incriminating evidence that he could have turned into the NCAA if he really wanted to get Ohio State back. I think they worked out a deal, and that's why I honestly think he's going to go back to coaching. If he jumps to the NFL or stays in college, I don't know. At this point, uh, we can get right into the other bowl games now. The other big one that stood out to me was Iowa killed USC to the point where USC is dead. I thought for sure they were just going to fire Clay Helton. After they said they were going to keep him, they they finished last in recruiting in the Pac-12 so far on the early signing day. And then they go out and play Iowa, a team they traditionally match up well with because USC typically has long, athletic, wide receivers, and those are the type of teams that give Iowa fits. Even though they kind of would play a similar game, Iowa just destroyed them. USC has no identity. And watching that game... If Urban takes another year off and he wants it, the job's his. I mean, that's it. Clay Helton, there's no way he lives past next year. It's already embarrassing enough as it is. What do you think, Matt? We'll start with you. I, I didn't want to believe it, but if if you're right, and it, and it is a situation that he was pushed out, and that now he's waiting for whatever statute of limitations for him to be... Um, accused of anything runs its course then it makes sense that wait wait till that period's up and then transition over which could be why usc waited and decided to keep play helton and where he is just said no just we'll give you another year or give you more time that it's a, that fake lead of giving him what he needs to just keep the seat occupied until the opportunity to, to put the contract together for Urban goes into play. Um, I, I think that would be a very interesting move for USC and definitely would, would get them right back to recruiting in a hurry. The thing that I saw out of that game, though, was that Iowa was just focused. 
from from the pregame. Like USC came out and they didn't even know what end zone they were supposed to be warming up in. And that's <laughs> like, like you come out and like you know, like they came out and they're like confused. They're like warming <laughs> up on Iowa's side. Like from from the the pregame to the game, Iowa just mopped the field with them. Well, like I said, it is a shit show. You couldn't look at that team and be like, that head coach knows what he's doing. <laughs> I mean, come on. They had a coach that was drunk at whatever events, athletic events, and the team looked better than what they did on that game. <laughs> come on, that's embarrassing. I don't know how any USC guy watched that game and was like, hey, I really like the direction of our program because there's zero, zero things to like. And I'm not even saying that there was like a statue of limitation. I just think that Ohio State, they worked out an agreement like, hey, we're going to have you step down. We're going to name you the assistant athletic director. I think Urban Meyer was like, I want to take my year off. It worked well after the Florida thing. I'm going to see what opportunities are out there. Maybe he thought USC was going to make the move. And or maybe he maybe USC was ready to make that jump at him. And he said, I want to talk to the Cowboys first. You never know. There, there's no rule that says USC still can't fire their coach and hire Urban Meyer at any time. I don't think it will happen. But after that game, could you really blame them if they did? But I like, don't think I, you're saying about his his reputation. I think if they wait and then he comes in late and he has a crap recruiting class, that's going to hurt him because it, it'll be, oh, he doesn't have he doesn't have it anymore. It, it was it was already built from the other programs. He can't do it here because it is going to be tougher to rebuild it at USC. I just don't know if that's true though, because he could easily jump in a national name. He's he's not that far removed. Like if he came in late this year, yeah, he would have one crap recruiting class. But he took over a six and six Ohio State program that was in transition after a bunch of guys left from the Jim Trestle area. He stepped in and made them go undefeated that first year, even though they weren't bull eligible. So he jumped into a tough situation, turned it around immediately, and realistically in the South, who is his competition? Even with USC recruiting poorly, they still have more roster talent than anyone else in their division. So he could jump in and potentially win the Pac-12 in his first year. If you go back and look at the team talent composite, USC was like 6th or 7th overall. They were still a top 10 team. They didn't lose that much, even with this one crap recruiting class. I mean, any transition coach is going to have a bad recruiting class. He might be able to come in late, flip a couple guys, four or five star guys that are wavering, into this spring thing and see what happens. I mean, I if the national championship game is played and the Cowboys decidedly don't hire Urban Meyer and all the NFL positions get filled and then like you hear rumors that Clay Helton actually is fired like January 20th, I wouldn't be surprised because there's only one coach that they're going to hire at that point and that would be Urban. But Jeff, what's your situation on this? Because I know you you always like USC. You you. I always get the feeling, yeah. Jeff, that you like the stronger <laughs> teams historically being strong. Yeah. Am I wrong? I, I don't know. When I was young, I liked uh, USC with um, Reggie Bush and Matt Liner and them. But I've, I've talked about on the show before with USC, they should be able to recruit with their name and prestige alone. And clearly that's not happening anymore. And the fact that USC you know, has such a poor recruiting class in the Pac-12 is, is unbelievable to me. And the, the future of that program – is uh, really up in the air right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they try to get Urban Meyer, like, you know, get a splash head coach like that because they need something. They're not recruiting anymore. They've always been able to recruit and they're not playing well. And yeah, I really like Matt's point, you know, from a coaching perspective, the fact that they weren't ready in pregame USC is a huge red flag. When you're a team that, you know, has the talent that they, you know, on paper do, and they can't even find the right end zone to warm up in, that's a huge problem. That's a huge red flag. So I'm not sure what the future of that uh, program is going to be, but they need change, and they need change now. All right. It's going to be tough. We'll see what happens with getting coaches in place for the NFL and also college. But let's go around one more time for bowl games. That was my big one, USC, Iowa. Matt, we'll start with you. What other bowl games stood out to you? Just the way that that the Washington State Air Force game played out. Um, 
Uh, I was rooting for Mike Leach, but I wasn't surprised that that the uh, Air Force Academy was able to pull the win out because the old saying goes, you pass for show and you run for dough. In the end of the day, with plays stepping down as Washington State's defensive coordinator, Washington State did not handle the formations well. They were given stuff that, as I was watching, I thought, good God, like that, that's a offensive play caller's dream because the guys were just – they were misaligned so badly that they were just giving running lanes to Air Force. That was the reason I picked Air Force. I don't know if we went through all our picks on the show, but I definitely had Air Force because Tracy Clay stepped down, and when he did in the middle of the season – Washington State has not looked the same at all. I mean, they got ran out of the building a couple times, so pretty easy to see. And that's another reason why I want the expanded playoff. How do you know Air Force won't one day win the Mountain West? Why not put some of the traditional powers and give them an actual path to the playoffs? As it stands right, right now, Army, Navy, Air Force, they'll never be in. But if they're given a chance to, hey, win a conference... Maybe some of those independent teams will join a smaller conference, and then you'll be able to see them get to the point where, hey, we're going to win the Conference USA, or like we're going to win the MAC, and we're going to be a traditional power and give them a chance to play in the playoffs. Hell, I'd like to see LSU to try to take on Navy's triple option late in the season. Crazy matchup. So why not? Give it to me. Um, but I do, I do think the service academies do stand more of a chance now because it's starting to get a little bit of a reputation positively um, with, with them with running that scheme. And I think a big thing for them is that they're with President Trump signing um, the deferment. That's going to be a draw for potential people to the service academies, knowing that if you're good enough to make the plays and, and develop, that you can be an NFL player. You can defer your, your military service obligation. I think that could that could help steer some potential talent that would otherwise be negatively recruited and say, oh, well, why would you go there? You're not going to go to the NFL. If your end game is the NFL and you're able to take advantage of the, the funding and finances and resources that the Department of Defense can put into the Army and Navy and Air Force, well, why not take advantage of that? I think that's a big thing we've been talking about for a while is getting guys and giving them a chance to get into the NFL so, yeah, they have that path, but I still think the recruiting is never going to be the same for them. Give them a chance to join a smaller conference. I mean, look at what App State's doing in the conference they're in. I would love to see them in the playoffs. They don't have a path right now. They could go 11-1, and one, do whatever they're doing, and they'll never get in. If you give Navy or Air Force an, a chance to do it, let's see them in it because I think that would add – some prestige. People think that oh, if you expand the playoffs, it's going to be like LSU taking on Eastern Michigan in the first round. And that might be true, but a lot of the times it might not be. A lot of these teams that win the conference, I think most years, they're double digit win teams. So they deserve to have a chance at the playoffs. And we've proved that we, I put out on the Southbound Sports last year, we did the same thing. I put out the group of five champions from the last couple of years in each conference. And a lot of people came around and were like, oh, I didn't realize it would have been Boise at 11-1 and one, uh, for a bunch of those years or UCF at undefeated a couple of those years. Like, yeah, they're putting out quality champions from those, uh, those teams. And to be honest, up until this year's Memphis-Penn State game, the group of five team that made the New Year's Six Bowl, they had won five years in a row. So they, they've earned it. You're putting them in right now against a lesser team. They've proved five and one the past six years. They're kicking the shit out of those schools. The teams that didn't win their major power six conference or whatever you want to call them, power five. So give them a chance. How do you know they won't take that step and beat, beat one of the top teams? I just like to see it. Jeff, what bull game stood out to you before we get into the final bell? Uh, the bull game st- uh, stood out to me was the pit game. Um, they, you know, didn't want to, play Eastern Michigan and they almost lost. Uh, the fact that they were essentially thought they're too good for Eastern Michigan and only won 34 or 30 is a real slap in the face for the pit program. Uh, especially after I was really high on this year, I thought they played, you know, pretty well overall. They ended up seven and five. Now the bull went eight and five, but this was a team that 
took Penn State to the brink, beat uh, UCF. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what it means for the program because, to me, this was not an impressive win. I don't think it even helps them with recruiting. Um, the only thing it gives them that extra win makes them 8-5 and five overall, but I think is they didn't play well. <laughs> that's, that's what stood out to me. For as much as <laughs> – I anticipated the game, thought they were going to play well against a 6-6 six and six team. They played horribly and barely won. Yeah, I was going to touch on this game. I had Pitt. I, I didn't pick them because they were going on the road to Detroit, playing basically a home game for Eastern Michigan. And traditionally, teams closer to the Bull, places like that, they usually win. It's just easier for them to prepare whenever they're playing at a home crowd. Look at USC in the Rose Bowl. That's why, like, the Rose Bowl, to some people, that's, like, the tip-top game. But to me, I, d- I don't care about it at all. I would rather them mix it up and play in different locations because I know that if you're a Big Ten team and your dreams to get to the Rose Bowl, you're just delusional. Why? No one cares about that game. It's not 1968 anymore. Like, you should be pushing for them to play at a neutral site that's actual neutral. Play in Jerry's world. Like, how about you give your team a chance instead of playing right at USC's home field? Because I think that's bullshit. But Pitt had to go there, couldn't get fired up. I, I, I took the opposite approach, Jeff. I tried to think, what game did Pitt really look good at this year? And my answer was zero of them. There was not one game where I thought, wow, Pitt really stood out to me. And games that they won, I, I thought they were all games they should have won. T- games that they could have took that step and possibly won their division... They choked. So I had zero confidence in them going forward. And the program I have zero confidence in. They're not recruiting well. I, I joked earlier about them only looking at Florida. It's basically what Narduzzi's doing. It's like, what are you doing? I have no idea which direction they're going. They're like in this weird spot where they're trying to be West Virginia, but yet they're running the same offense that like... Uh, a pro team would run where you're just doing like passes and stuff, but you don't have the athletes for it. So it's like a weird mix. I don't even know how to explain it. That's pit. Sometimes you can get tricky yeah. enough to win, but like when the years they don't have the signature wins, it's almost like that was, that was our season. Yeah. Like there's nothing I, I to feel would've... good about. Like you can go back to the past years. They beat Miami when they're ranked number two, they beat Clemson when they're ranked number two. If you take those big upsets away, it's the same exact thing. I am. But I think the thing this year was a little different. And I, I disagree with you. I think they played really well against Penn State and UCF uh, UCF this year. Penn State, they were a couple plays away from beating Penn State. Took them to the brink at Happy Valley. And as much as it kills me to say, that was a pretty good Penn State game. Uh, pretty good Penn State team this year. Um, the UCF game, they played well. Um, the two games that really stuck out to me, though, for Pitt, well, three actually, the Delaware game. They played so bad at home. I was at that game. They almost <laughs> lost to Delaware. It was awful. Um, they pulled it off, but that was a that was a game they should have never been should have never been close. Uh, the other games, uh, the end of the year, Boston College. They shouldn't have lost to Boston College, and they just shouldn't have lost at home in Miami. I was at that game too. It was a rainy day. They played really bad at home. This was a pit team that easily going into the bowl season should have been nine and three. Hands down to me, should have been nine and three with losses to Penn State. Virginia and Virginia Tech. That's not a bad season. But when you drop the games to Boston College in Miami, who they should have beat, you're now sitting at seven and five, and it's a very subpar year considering how well they played Penn State and beat UCF. Um, so that's my opinion on Pitt this year. And I, I don't I agree with you. I don't know about the outlook of the program. Narduzzi might not be the guy. And if you look at you know his tenure at Pitt right now, he is a seven and five coach. He's an eight and four coach. He's not getting it done on a consistent basis. Like you mentioned, he has some signature wins that, you know, some great upsets against, you know, Clemson and Miami. He played Virginia Tech uh, pretty well a couple of times. But other than that, it's very average. It's almost like he's just coasting along. And I really don't know what the direction of the program is or where it's going. On the other hand, you have Penn State, the last bull game that we'll touch on before we get to the final bell. They got pushed by Memphis, which I was surprised at because Memphis lost their coach. And usually the team rallies around, but without that coach sticking around, there's a significant drop-off in the bowl game, just traditionally, if you look at the stats. But they came out. The only thing that really helped Penn State is they just had bigger and better athletes. 
Like I didn't see anything from the coaching staff that made me think, oh yeah, Penn State's really pulling it on here. I saw the same James Franklin things where he's like right before halftime, he's messing up the clock, the way they handled it, and blew themselves some points. It's like, what are you doing? And then they come out in the second half and they have their running back red hot, and yet they kind of like don't even go to him. They just start running screens and things, and it's like, okay, Penn State's going to turtle here. They're just going to go in and punt, which is exactly what happened. And then, I mean, I was watching with Penn State fans. I could point out things that happened. I'm like, oh, yeah, here comes Penn State. They're going to punt it here. They'll set it for a field goal because that's all they need. It was almost like they just did enough. They were kind of like, we know we have better athletes than them. Let's not, I, like, they weren't showing their hand, but it's a bull game. Like, what are you doing? So if I'm a Penn State fan, I have to wonder about the direction of the program. Sure, you get another double-digit win season, but the same thing like Pitt. Okay, what what are your signature wins? Was it Memphis? Like, I just think that the Bull, that matchup, and and how things ended, like, you're not going to end on a positive note for Penn State. You just couldn't at that point. You would almost would have wished, if you're a Penn State fan, like almost to flip it the bull with Michigan where you could take on Alabama or something. At least that's how I would feel. Cause I feel like you're looking at two programs. If Michigan beats Alabama, which by the time I don't think will happen, just so you know, when this comes out, you'll probably know that Alabama killed Michigan and it'll be like 35 to 10. But I will say like if Penn state, if they were to have a signature win to end the season, I feel like they would have a different feeling going into next year where it's like, yeah, we beat Memphis. Thanks. Thanks big 10 for this bull game. It's like weird. Like I almost like if that was Penn State killing USC, just because it's a name program, I, I think they would have more confident going forward into next year. Matt, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I kind of thought with Penn State's bowl game against Memphis and Pitts with East Michigan that they were no win situations. Like with, in both cases, they should have won. There, there was nothing that like so you go in and you win the game that you're supposed to win. Great. And in the chance that they were upset, then it's, it's an egg on the face of both programs. So they, they won the game that they were supposed to. To me, I, I think for Penn State, it was an opportunity to, to work through their coordinator issues and trying to figure out what, what they need to do to get better offensively. And with Pitt, it's the same old same. I was actually surprised statistically seeing how well the defense is playing because typically it's been the defense giving up big plays that start Pitt. It's the offense. It's the offense that just is constantly three and outing, turning the ball over, doing stuff to, that puts the defense in bad spots. So I think if Narduzzi can figure that out, he can still be the right person for it. And I think he's providing stability to Pitt that hasn't been there in a while. So by keeping, by keeping him there and just allowing him to make the changes coordinator wise that he needs to, I, I, I don't think that they're that far off. You look at look at the two teams playing for the national championship right now. There are coaches that early in their tenures weren't successful. And had they been pushed out early on, you wouldn't see LSU and Clemson playing for the national championship. So there's something to be said about allowing coaches time to get get the recruiting program, go through those bumps with the school to see what they have to do to get it going in the right direction get the recruits in, and then you're able to win it consistently, knowing that you have a consistent figurehead at the program. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Definitely stick stick with the coach you have. Like, I don't think Pitt or anyone else like Penn State or any of those should be pushing their head coach out. I think you've seen it with Penn State where they've made changes to the coordinators. They were able to pull the offensive coordinator away from Minnesota. That's what Narduz- Narduzzi needs to do. Make those jumps and try to get better I feel like Franklin's able to do that every year, or at least he's trying, even if he loses coaches. I can't knock him for trying. And yeah, just to solidify my point, I agree, Matt, lose-lose situation. That's why a lot of people, when I look at the bull games, I think a lot of fans out there are just falling for like the the marketing that the college bull is putting out there. Like, yeah, we're in a New Year's Six game. What the hell does that even mean? That game was not on New Year's Six. Like that, that's just what they try to tell fans so that they feel better about playing a team like Memphis. No Penn State fan should have been happy with that draw. I mean, you can't, you can't even knock it because 
if you're looking at him, like I said, I compared the Michigan Alabama matchup to the Penn State Memphis. If you pulled any random fan, anyone else would say the Michigan Alabama matchup, that's the better matchup. If Penn State would play Alabama, even if they were to lose, people would say, well, Alabama was like a top team all year. And if they were somehow to win or play close, then everyone's like, wow, Penn State's a lot better than I expected. Better matchup. Instead with Memphis, you're like, well, Memphis hang around with them pretty long. Is Penn State even that good? How good is Memphis? I don't know. Like it changes the entire narrative because they got stuck with a shitty bull matchup. And I'm sorry if people, like I said, I'm a champion for getting these, like Memphis should have been in the playoffs. Expand it and put them in. Then you don't, then you get rid of these bull situations. If you're trying to tell me, the NCAA is trying to tell me that these bull games matter, give me matchups that matter then. Put Memphis in the playoffs. Don't tell me Penn State and Memphis matter because it did not. And Michigan, Alabama, even though that's a better matchup, does not matter. It doesn't matter. If Michigan were somehow to win, you're not going to tell me that Alabama was the worst team this year. Because it doesn't matter. They're having guys sitting out. Uh, their their star quarterbacks hurt. Like that game does nothing, except for like casual fans. So that's my last thought. I don't know how long we've gone since we're not going live. So we'll wrap it up with the final bell. Matt, what do you got for us? So I want to provide a little bit of a backstory for my final bell. Earlier in the year, Harvard and Yale played their football game, and. The game had to be delayed because a giant protest came out and students were sitting on the field and they allowed them this like protesting time. I don't know if you caught this, but during the Texas Bowl, Oklahoma State and Texas A&M, a person was trying to protest on behalf of PETA and saying that the, the teams that use mascots like Revelry at A&M should not have to use these animals for as mascots. They should retire them. Texas took care of it and just dragged that person right off. The it was like, go protest somewhere else. You're not in the Ivy League anymore. So I thought that was that was interesting that you saw the political antics in the Ivy League does not fly in Texas. Wait, so they're protesting the dog? Am I hearing that right? They, they were protesting. Well, it, it was all of the animals. So like revelry was at A&M, but there was also like, they, they were protesting Georgia's uh, the Bulldog. Bulldog mascot and Bevo at Texas, like Osceola at Florida State, any of the, the schools that use animals as mascots are like, they should not be used as animals. Meanwhile, I think George, they, they showed like a special one, the Bulldog from Georgia. He's living better than all of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. God forbid yeah. a Bulldog gets fed every day and a bunch of people go and play with it. Whenever you could have that bulldog be owned by Michael Vick and in some type of fighting ring instead. Like, what, what is PETA trying to accomplish here? Like, these dogs are taken care of. It doesn't make any sense to me. Like, would you rather have it being put down? I don't know. I don't understand. All right. Jeff, what do you got for final, Bill? You got anything? Uh, my final thing is, um, unlike you, I'm actually looking forward to the Rose Bowl this uh What's it tomorrow? Um, Oregon, Wisconsin. I'm looking forward to that game. I think that's going to be an interesting one. Um, it looks like Wisconsin's uh, the favorite, but I'm going to take Oregon in that game. Georgia, Baylor. Uh, I'm going to take Georgia. And then Michigan, Alabama. I'm taking Alabama. Those are my three games I'm looking forward to to end out the bowl season. Matt, you have any predictions? Wow, that, that one hurts. It just skipped right over the fighting herms. <laughs> I, I want to see the Knowles upset Arizona State tomorrow I don't have any predictions I have one last tidbit though J.K. Dobbins is going to enter the NFL draft and I couldn't be more pleased J.K. Dobbins was an awesome running back I thought oh, he was one of yeah. the best in the league he had game breaking speed and I think the NFL is where he can really succeed so I'm glad he made the right decision <laughs> and didn't decide to come back to college. So that's how I'm going to end the show. Uh, you guys have anything else? Go to southboundsports.com. Check out the website. You're making some good changes to it. Uh, if you were a deadbeat and did not buy your significant other anything, go to the store. Buy something for him. Yeah, check that out. For the new year, we're going to have some new improvements as the Steelers are out early, so it gives me a lot of free time to 
watch some other games and work on some stuff. So if there's anything you would like to see, let me know. We're trying to get some more interactive stuff going on this off season as we get ready for the next college football season in the fall. But thanks for listening. Go to southboundsports.com for that. Uh, check out our stuff there. You can follow us on social. I'm trying to make that easier too. So thanks for listening, and we will see you next week.